So in our session, we will talk about building an academic phrase bank, which is a very important component of academic writing. It's a very important component for you as you begin to build your academic writing and publishing skills. And we've talked already about a number of aspects of academic writing, including language communication, including tips for effective communication. And we've also started our discussion of writing a paper, putting an academic article together. And there are templates, as you know, there are tricks that you can apply. There are approaches that you can take towards putting together an effective academic article, but it depends upon your subject area. It depends upon your particular field. Every researcher has a different specific research field. It's your PhD. It's your research area. It's your topic of particular interest. So the kind of phrase bank, the kind of vocabulary that you will develop will be different to somebody else working in a different subject area. And this is critical. And so as you develop your writing skills, as you develop your skill set as a writing and publishing academic researcher, you will also develop what we refer to as a phrase bank of terms and words and phrases that you use in your writing. So let's talk about how we can start to do that because it begins with paraphrasing. It begins with reading. It begins with understanding the work of other researchers in your subject area. You're reading papers all the time, especially if you're starting work on your PhD or on your MSc, you are reading articles all the time. And it's a key skill to develop how to paraphrase, how to express other people's ideas, their facts, their opinions in different words. And as you develop your skills in paraphrasing, you will start to develop your phrase bank as an academic. You might be a physicist, you might be a chemist, you might be a linguist. Of course, the words, the phrases that you use in your writing will be different to the words and phrases that somebody else will use in theirs. So how can we start to think about drawing logical relationships between the papers that we read and converting those into our own words. How can we translate text and information into another language and then later translate it back into English? This is a great technique for paraphrasing, verbally explaining ideas to colleagues, recording yourself, naming an author and learning to use appropriate reporting verbs such as Gareth stated, Gareth concluded, Gareth suggested, Gareth argued, Gareth claimed, as well as certainty verbs. It must be the case. It will be the case. It could be the case. And your text, your paraphrased text, will go into different sections of your paper. And so will need to be written differently in those different sections. If you're paraphrasing information, for example, for the introduction of your next article, then that text will be different to the kinds of information that you put into the discussion because of course your introduction sets the scene tells the reader about the objectives of the work and then states the question whereas your discussion is set up around giving your reader answers and talking about the significance of your data so here are some examples of good and bad paraphrasing at the top of the slide is my original text in black. The magnitude of the change in carbon storage depends on how physical, chemical, or biological processes are altered over time under different land uses. That's the original text. Now I could paraphrase that text in a basic way by just changing the synonyms and the word order. 
as you can see in the example just below. I've just changed some words. I've just moved some words around. The size of the carbon storage change depends on how physical, chemical, or biological processes are changed over time under different land uses. Even though I've cited the original source, it's very similar to the original text. I'm not paraphrasing effectively. I'm not developing my own phraseology. I'm not building my own style. How differing land use gradually affects biological, chemical, or physical processes changes how much carbon can be stored. In this example, nouns are switched to verbs, prepositional phrases to adverbs, and I've switched from the passive voice into the active voice, as well as changing synonyms and word order. So have a look at these examples, because what you're aiming for is effective paraphrasing, changing the word order, the synonyms, but also changing the voice, changing the style of the writing. And I know it's different, it's difficult, it's a trick that you'll develop, it's a skill that you'll gain as you get more experience at this, and it's especially difficult if you're working in a non-native language. But translate, and then translate back. Explain to a colleague. Talk to yourself about the arguments that you're reading about in papers. Record yourself. Get the transcript of that recording. Use the transcript of that recording to form the basis of your paraphrased text. And don't forget to cite the original. As you can see here, Lee et al. from PLOS One 2013 must be cited, or even the paraphrased text will be plagiarized. And don't forget that that's one of the key areas of academic plagiarism, paraphrasing plagiarism, where you take a source, you rewrite that source, but you don't cite the original. So keeping that in mind as well. How to vary your sentence structure is important to avoid the use of lists, sentence logic, introductory phrases, changing your voice, the rhythm, the style of your writing, separating and joining sentences, using discourse markers, changing the word class, for example, either or, neither nor, not only, but also are examples of sentence logic. It either is the case that this is true or it is the case that that is true. Neither Dyke nor Smith was able to show this example effectively, but also Dyke's later work and so on. You can use these techniques. You can take these phraseologies from these sentence structures and start to think about how you will develop your own unique style as an academic, how you will develop your own voice, how you will develop over time your own academic phrase bank. Here is some examples of how this has not worked out well. An example of weak idea linking in text. Problem-based learning is an instructional method in which problems are the focal part of learning. That's the background, the beginning of my introduction. However, it is clear which particular aspect of the trigger statement is essential for student learning. I then give the research question. I'm building the structure of my introduction in the correct way, but I'm not logically linking my ideas together in an appropriate fashion because I'm using different phrases for the same concept in different sections of my introduction. Problems, trigger statements, input variables. In the three different parts of your introduction, this example, we've used different phrases, problems, trigger statements, and input variables. And then in the discussion, as you can see at the bottom in green, again, a different phrase, a different word use for the same idea. Artifact characteristics. It's confusing for readers. It's hard to follow. Using a weak linkage between ideas is not a good approach to get your message across clearly. So what about a good example of how this could be done? Here's better linking of ideas between the different sections of your introduction. 
Problem-based learning is an instructional method in which problems are the focal part of learning. However, it is unclear which particular aspect of the problem is essential for student learning. This study tested a model in which it was hypothesized. So in the three parts of the introduction, same phraseology, problem-based learning, problems, problems, problem input variables. The reader is able to follow the text clearly and simply from the beginning to the end. Remember, your introduction has three sections, background, research question, and objectives. In the first part of the introduction, you set the scene. In the second part of the introduction, you tell the reader the state of the art. In the third part of your introduction, you set up the question, the objective. And notice in this example as well, in the discussion, the same phraseology, the same words are used at the end. In conclusion, this study is among the first to shed more light on the causal interactions of specific problem characteristics at the micro level. Notice the same use of words throughout the sections of this article. Ideas are being linked effectively together. And this is how, by the way, you build a strategy for effective arguments in your academic writing. You're going to be working on papers. You're going to be writing papers where you've got a claim or somebody else has a claim, and you're going to be either refuting that claim or modifying that claim. You're going to give a reason and a reason against, evidence for and evidence against. This is how you build an argument. This is how you phrase your work. This is how you build an effective academic phrase bank. By making your arguments clear and by doing it in a way that makes it easy for readers to understand what you are talking about. So think about this building argument validity, building your questions and building your content as you structure your arguments. And this, by the way, is especially important when putting together article titles and article abstracts. The title is the window into your paper. It's the first thing that readers will see. It must be clear, concise, and convincing. And it can take one of several styles. What we want are either question-based titles, informative titles, or indicative titles. The title is very, very important. Short titles are better. Seven words or less is better for a title. That length of title will get more citations. It will be more likely to be read by other researchers. And keep your keywords that you use in your title different from the words that you put into your keyword section. This is also absolutely critical. You need to have different keywords in your title to the keywords that you use in your keyword section when you put your papers together because the keywords and the title words will be used by the same search engines when searching for your paper online. So it's actually a waste of keywords if you put the same words into the title as you put into the keyword section of your paper. So some examples of titles that you might write, a question-based title. How does coral mucus contribute to sponge loops in coral reef ecosystems? An informative title. Coral mucus fuels sponge loops in coral reef ecosystems and an indicative title, Effect of Coral Mucus on Sponge Loops in Coral Reef Ecosystems. A question, an informative title that tells the reader the answer, actually, and an indicative title that sets the scene. Most journals are actually most keen on receiving titles that are indicative. They don't want titles that give away the answer. They don't want informative titles. They don't want question-based titles. 
they tend to want researchers to write what we like to call indicative titles. And this is especially true of articles written in the medical sciences. Medical sciences, health science journals, they don't want papers where all of the information about the study is presented in the title. We don't want doctors just reading the title of a paper and running off and prescribing a drug, for example. That would not be a good thing. So have a look at this. Have a think about your title, what you are going to do to be effective with that particular part of your academic writing. Very clear. The second thing to think about when building your academic phrase bank is the abstract. This is a very important piece of writing, usually about 200 to 250 words in length, and it gives the background, the aim, the methods, the results, and the conclusion. Remember, writing an effective abstract is best done based around four questions. What did you do? What did you find? What did you conclude? And what is the significance of the study? What did you do? What did you find? What did you conclude? And what's the significance of the study? Those are the key things that people will want to read about in the abstract to your next paper. You've got the context, the problem. You've got the objective, the research question, the hypothesis, any techniques and measurements, the most important findings and the relevance and implications of your work. As you build your phrase bank, as you build this as a writer, you will gradually develop these skills. Putting together the different sections of your paper, of course, comes from your reading. And that's why it's so important to read around your field. Read widely, read lots of papers, form discussion groups in which you talk about key developments in your own research field. Building your academic phrase bank. 